a wonderful day to celebrate our veterans and those who have served in our armed forces to protect and promote the causes of freedom. And uh, I'm so thankful that people have worked so hard to, to do something special for our uh, veterans today. And it's a wonderful meal that's been prepared over here in the West Wing. Uh, and so at the very beginning, I want to do a little bit of what Barry did already, which is to recognize our veterans. Uh, and it's uh, something that I want to, uh, what I'm going to do in just a second is, is ask all of our veterans to stand. But we have one veteran in the back, uh, Bob Meeks, who can't stand. Bob lost his legs and an eye in Vietnam. And, and I know we all want to express our admiration for his sacrifice. And, and I'm sorry that, that Bob can't stand. But I'm thankful that people like Bob have made the type of sacrifice that Bob made. Amen. And so if our other veterans will stand just so that you can know who they are. We may have some guests here who served in the armed forces. Please stand as well, even though we may not uh, realize that you were. God bless you all, gentlemen. We appreciate uh, what you have done. We appreciate what those did also who didn't come back. On the theme of veterans, I want us to think for just a few minutes about the respect that God has for people who serve in the military. I asked Brother Eli to read this passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 10 because it teaches us a mindset. There are a lot of different symbols, a lot of different analogies or illustrations or however, whatever word you want to use that God uses in Scripture to teach us what He wants us to be. He uses the analogy of a building and us being a block in a building. He uses the analogy of us being laborers in the vineyard. He uses the analogy of us being body parts all joined together to make one body. But he also uses the analogy of warfare and the military and those who serve in armed forces. And that's what is being used here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 when Paul talks about the weapons of our warfare. And for those who want to follow Christ, those who want to do the will of God and to be what God calls us to be, we have to understand that we are engaged in spiritual warfare. That we are called to serve in a spiritual military. And in several different passages, God uses this idea to explain to us what he wants us to be. And he calls on a lot of different things and makes a lot of different points. But he tells us that we are involved in at least two different fronts in this spiritual war. One of which is like here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It's also in Ephesians 6 where we are attacking those spiritual forces of darkness in the heavenly places. Those speculations. Those things raised up against the knowledge of God. We're engaged in a spiritual warfare in regard to those things. The second front, or one of the other fronts in this spiritual warfare, is the warfare of temptation. The warfare of the flesh versus the spirit. This is talked about in a few places. Romans 7, 23 says, But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. James chapter 4 verse 1 says, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasure that wage war in your members? So God tells us that we're supposed to be engaging in spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare against those things that are raised up against the knowledge of God and those wicked forces in heavenly places who would cast out the knowledge and obedience of God and faith in God from our lives, from our society, from our culture. 
And we're also to be engaged in the spiritual warfare that preys upon our temptations and tries to take our natural desires and our natural physical needs and use them to turn us against God. So how do we engage in this warfare? Well, that's where the veterans come in. That's where the soldiers and the airmen and the sailors and all of the different, the Marines and the different terms that are used to describe members of the armed forces. Learning from this physical military member, this soldier, and applying it to our spiritual warfare shows us God's respect for those who serve in the armed forces. And that's what I want us to talk about for just a few minutes today. One of the things that God uses, and I'm going to call them soldiers, and I know that people who weren't in the army don't call themselves soldiers, but the Bible, in my translation of the Bible, usually uses the term soldier, so I'm going to ask your permission to use that, and, and if you object to that, I apologize. Soldiers suffer hardship. They sacrifice. It's one of the things that we respect the most. And we respect those who have lost limbs. We respect those families who have lost sons and daughters. We respect those who have lost their mental stability because they have gone to fight. Because they have taken the risk. I remember several years ago, I saw an interview on the news, and it was during the time of the Iraq war was at its most volatile. And I was watching the Bill O'Reilly show on Fox, and he had the noted documentary filmmaker Michael Moore on there. And they were debating the surge in Iraq and the sacrifices and the men that were being killed to take Fallujah. And Michael Moore said to Bill O'Reilly, would you sacrifice your son to take Fallujah? And it was a rhetorical device, for no better word. It was a method of argument to try to win an argument of, of battle of words. But it carries this idea that nobody would sacrifice their son for the good of other people. And if I'd been sitting there and you asked me that question seriously, I would have said, no, I wouldn't sacrifice my son to take the loot. No way. But the answer is this. I'd sacrifice myself. And that's the attitude of the soldier. The soldier doesn't sacrifice his son. He sacrifices himself. Now, his family has to endure that sacrifice, but they don't choose it. They don't desire it. They don't want it. They take the risk. But it's not a trading of lives for something. It's the, it's the incurring of risk that happens. And that's what God uses to teach us. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, Paul says, Suffer hardship with me, as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. God uses the hardship of warfare and the hardship of military service to teach us the mindset that he wants us to have, which is the willingness to suffer, the willingness to to take risks, the willingness to give our lives if necessary. Suffer hardship with me as a soldier, he says. That's what he wants. We had a brother here for several years who has now passed away, W.A. McCaffins. He was a prisoner of war in the Korean conflict. And I remember him telling me the story. He said they were given a ration of rice every day. And he said the rice that he ate, and I've forgotten how long he was a prisoner, but it was something over a year, as best I can remember. But he said they would give him a ball of rice the size of a golf ball. And that's what he had to eat every day. Suffer hardship with me as a soldier. It's 
what God wants from us. A willingness to give. A willingness to sacrifice. Another thing about soldiers is they focus on the objective. They focus on something that is to be accomplished. Something that is to be completed. On D-Day, the men were to take the beaches. And there was a terrible sacrifice of life to take the beaches. And what they had to do was take the beaches. And they did what was necessary to take the beaches. And they fought and they pushed and they fought and they pushed. Focused on that one objective. It's what God wants for months. Romans, I mean Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus teaches a single-minded determination, a single-minded focus on the kingdom of God. Make sure that God is king in your life. That only. That first. And put everything else aside. Focus on the objective. Put it first above everything else. And don't compromise. And do what it takes to accomplish it. It's one of the reasons God loves soldiers. Another reason is that soldiers train for victory. They go through all kinds of training, all kinds of difficulties, basic training, advanced training, and skills training, and on and on and on it goes. But you know that when our military men go out, that they're ready, and they have to know their weapons, they have to know their rifles, or they have to know that tank, or they have to know that cannon, or that helicopter, or that submarine, or whatever it may be. And whatever small part of that machine, if it's a large machine that they're charged with, they have to know it. They have to be able to use it under pressure and do it right. Or entire countries can fail. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. God wants us to know our weapons. God wants us to know our equipment. And he uses a Roman soldier's equipment to teach us to know ours. Romans, I mean not Romans, Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 11. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Here it is again. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Make no mistake, you are at war. Verse 13, therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. How do you do that? Verse 14, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, take up the shield of faith, which will be able to, to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Do you know what your weapons are? Can you name your weapons? Do you know how to use your weapons? Do you have any familiarity with your weapons? Do you practice with your weapons? Do you drill and train with your weapons? Have you ever thought about in what sense salvation is a help? You should, because it's your weapon. It's your protection. It's part of your armor. The soldier does. The soldier knows what his helmet is for. He knows what his rifle is for. He knows what his bayonet is for. He knows what his computer is for. He knows how to use his walkie-talk. Do you know how to use yours? It's one of the reasons that God respects soldiers. Finally, God respects soldiers because soldiers die for the cause. They give their lives. And he calls them. 
Romans 8, verse 36 and 37 says, Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. He quoted the Old Testament there, but he says that we're being put to death. Paul's talking about Christians. He's talking about followers of Christ. He compares them to sheep ready for the slaughter, where you take a bunch of sheep and you put them in a small pen, and one at a time you take them through the chute, and you take their lives. He says we're the same way. And you can read story after story of epic and tragic battles. I've read several from the Civil War where thousands of men were killed in less than an hour. You can read the same thing in World War II and World War I and all of these other wars. But those men died. Revelation 2, verse 10 says, Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. God wants people who are willing to die. God wants followers who think that his purposes and his objectives are more important than their physical existence. Jesus calls his followers to follow him. He went to the cross, and he gave his physical life. He's talking about commitment. He's talking about sacrifice. He's talking about humility. He's talking about giving up of your personal selfish desires for the greater good, even to the point where you cease to exist here on earth. That's faith in a greater cause. That's faith in a higher purpose. That's faith in something bigger than yourself. It's one of the reasons that God loves soldiers. It's one of the reasons that he teaches us to be like soldiers and to see ourselves in this manner. Because we're involved in a spiritual warfare which is much larger than our physical lives here on earth. And we believe in a God who is greater than our physical life here on earth. And we believe in an eternal destination that is far more important than the length of our time here on earth. And if you can't invest yourself in that, if you can't give yourself to that, you've got no place in this army. You can't use it. Jesus' promise is this. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Not be faithful until you risk death and then retreat, but that you go all the way. I hope you'll appreciate what God uses the military to teach us. I hope it will help you and inspire you to bow down before our Creator, to give Him everything that you have. What He will give you in return is far greater than what we give our veterans. What He will give you in return is far more valuable and far more glorious than any parade that has ever been thrown or any benefit that has ever been granted. It's worth it. Not only that, it helps other people. It brings other people closer and inspires them to greater faith and commitment. If you haven't yet given yourself completely, if you haven't entrusted yourself to the Savior, if you haven't bowed at the foot of the cross, humbled yourself, do so today. If you need to come to Christ for the first time, the steps are very simple. Put your faith in Jesus. Put yourself, put your faith in who he is and what he did. Confess that faith. Confess him before men and he will confess you before his father. Repent of your sins. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. If you need to come to Christ for the first time, 
If you need to return to Christ, please come down front as we stand and sing.